So, uh, and uh, the talk will be given by Wei Yu, who is online. Are you here? We heard him before. Is Wei Yu, are you there? Wei Yu, are you here? We do not hear you. Can I begin my presentation? Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Yu Wei. I'm I'm from Statistics of Laboratory of Information Security, Institute, Institute of Information Engineering, Chinese Academy of Science. Uh, this is from Beijing, China. It's my honor to introduce my, my work on Europe. Your audio has stopped working. We cannot hear you. Your audio has stopped working. We cannot hear you. I think we should probably go to the next speaker because this audio is not working. Yeah, yeah I think it's the best. So can the next speaker who is the next speaker? Uh, I think myself. I, I can. If, if I can share. Okay, so I so the for technical reasons we we begin by the second talk uh, by Alex Beryukov and Alexei Udovenko, and uh, Alexei will uh, give the talk. So Alexei, please. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction, Louis. Uh, I will be talking about how to use and how not to use uh, dummy shuffling to protect against algebraic attacks in white box implementations. In the white box model, the adversary has full access to the cryptographic implementation, typically of a symmetric key primitive. The main security goal is to prevent the key extraction. We focus on the most challenging direction, which is about implementations of existing primitives, such as the AS block cipher. This is in contrast with the idea of designing dedicated white box ciphers. A big threat to classic white box implementations is the differential computation analysis attack, or DCA, presented at CHESS 2016. DCA is basically an application of classic differential power analysis to white box implementations. What is so special in the white box setting is that there is no measurement noise. All computed bits can be recorded precisely. As the authors show, most existing white box implementations are broken fully automatically by DCA. This feels wrong, and it is natural to try to apply classic side channel countermeasures to strengthen white box implementations. The most popular and efficient protections against power analysis attacks are masking and shuffling. What happens if we apply them in the white box setting? Let's start with the masking countermeasure. Classic masking schemes are linear, and this unfortunately leads to a very powerful algebraic attack. Without going too much into details, let me just illustrate what happens in the attack. The adversary runs the implementation on some inputs and records all computed values, computational traces. At the same time, the adversary computes some sensitive function. For example, in the case of IS, it can be one output bit of an S-box in the first round which is a classical target in the side channel setting. 
Typically, such a function depends only on a few key bits, which can be easily guessed. Now, if a linear masking scheme is used to protect the sensitive value in the implementation, there must exist a subset of intermediate values that always add to the sensitive value. This can be expressed directly as a linear system of equations. After solving it, we obtain the positions of the shares, but more importantly, a confirmation that the sensitive value S was indeed computed in the shared form in the implementation. In the case of AS, it would confirm the right guess of the portion of the key. A big problem is that higher order masking would not help. The attack does not depend on the weight of the solution. The attack is very generic and automatic. It only requires recording of the traces and solving a linear system. As you can see from this slide, we ran the attack without knowing anything about the implementation. Now let me switch to the second side channel countermeasure I mentioned, shuffling. Assume that an implementation computes the same function t times in parallel. A usual example is the AS box cipher, where the same S box is computed 16 times in parallel in each round. The idea of shuffling is to randomize the order of the computations. It seems that shuffling is a complex nonlinear procedure and so should protect against algebraic attacks. Unfortunately, this is not true, as the sum of all values is independent of the shuffling order. And it is also a linear function of the computed values. Therefore, an algebraic attack can target this sensitive function. In the paper, we also show a new kind of attack, differential algebraic attack, that allows to break basic shuffling at a minimal cost. So both masking and shuffling are not sufficient to protect against the algebraic attack. What should we do? As the main result of our work, we show that extending basic shuffling with dummy slots is necessary and sufficient for protecting against algebraic attacks of any predetermined degree. Here I start with the basic shuffling described before. And the dummy shuffling simply adds a few dummy inputs, which are chosen independently and uniformly at random. And in the paper, we prove that this is enough to provide security against algebraic attacks of degree up to D, where D is the number of dummy slots. Uh, the proof is done in the security model that was presented at Asia Clip 2018. I'm going now to compare briefly the resulting protection with previous works. Previous protections against algebraic attacks are based on nonlinear masking schemes, first presented at Asia Clip three years ago for the case of the degree one attack, and later generalized at CHESS this year by Zeker, Eisenbarth, and Liskevich into a protection against degree two attacks combined with linear masking of arbitrary order. As we can see, uh, dummy shuffling scheme significantly improves both implementation complexity and the error lower bound, which determines the robustness of the protection against LPN variants of the attack. More importantly, it provides protection against arbitrary degrees of the attack and uh, at a very reasonable cost. Please find more results in the paper, including an interesting proof of concept construction which was used in one of the winning challenges of the VBOX 2019 competition. Thank you for your attention, and I will be glad for, to answer your questions. There is one question in Zoom. So <clears throat> thank you, Alexei. Are there questions for Alexei? Oh, there is one on the chat uh, from Stephen Galbraith. Uh, where does a white box crypto get randomness for the dummy blocks? If I control the execution environment, can I set all dummy blocks to zero? Uh, thank you for, for the question. It's a very good question. So uh, the idea is that we, we first have, uh, we focus on this sort of core so we try to find a way to perform computations with some setup, like in the classic uh, masking, there is some encoding step and decoding steps. So what we do here, we have similar model where we have encoding and decoding steps, which are not in the model yet. So it's, it is uh, yet to be uh, uh, to some work to do to extend the model to protect this encoding and decoding steps. So for now, they just exclude from the model and 
for white box implementations, they, they have to be predicted, they have to be implemented as a pseudo randomness. But uh, yes. Okay, thanks. Are there on any other questions? No, I don't think so. So we can thank Alexei again. So uh, we can switch to the next talk. Uh, the next talk is by Leo Duca, Mark Stevens, Wessel Van Verden. And uh, Wessel is here in the room and will give the talk. Perfect. I think we are up and running. So thank you for the introduction and thank you all for being here. So we'll start with a quick uh, overview of our work. So most of the NIST post-quantum crypto finalists are based on hard lattice problems. And practical crypto analysis is very important to understand the concrete security and to pick concrete uh, parameters for these schemes. So currently lattice sieving algorithms have the best practical and asymptotic runtime to solve these hard problems. And our main question was, how fit are advanced receiving algorithms for specialized hardware? So our contributions, we present the first GPU implementation using all state-of-the-art receiving techniques. And this improves both the runtime and energy efficiency by two orders of magnitude compared to a CPU-only implementation. And we use this to improve the SVP records from dimension 155 all the way up to 180. And additionally, we present the first practical implementation of the asymptotic best sieve, known as BDGO. So what's a lattice? Well, a lattice is a discrete additive group that's generated by some basis. And given any such basis, the shortest factor problem asks you to find the shortest non-zero uh, lattice factor. And one way to solve this problem is using lattice sieving. So the idea here is to start with a big list of factors that are relatively long. And then you try to find pairs of closed factors, such that their difference gives you a shorter vector. And then you replace the longer vector in your list with the shorter vector and you repeat this until uh, you have only short factors, uh, very short factors left. So the specialized hardware that we are considering are GPUs and more specifically tensor cores. So tensor cores uh, have originally been designed for machine learning purposes and they can do one thing very well. And this is a low precision matrix multiplication. So the old model we used could reach up to 108 16-bit teraflops uh, doing this in, in theory. Uh, while the current best CPU, you could only get uh, a few teraflops uh, doing this operation. Okay, so how does the sieving process uh, look for the more advanced sieves? We first have a bucketing phase where you uh, take the big list and you subdivide it into several buckets. Uh, and each of these, the, the vectors in each of these buckets are supposed to lie, uh, are expected to lie somewhat close to each other. And then inside of each bucket, you actually try to find these close pairs. And then these, these, these give you short vectors and these, uh, these are inserted back into your list. Okay, so let's first focus on this uh, second part. So in order to find close pairs, we have to compute all pairwise inner products between these vectors in a uh, bucket. And for large buckets, we can use these tensor cores to do this very efficiently. Uh, and we can compute these pairwise inner products with more than 60 teraflops uh, per GPU. However, for small buckets, we are, uh, have some memory bottlenecks. So sending the vectors to the GPU takes more time than to actually compute these uh, inner products. Okay, so I will now discuss uh, two uh, bucketing methods. So on one side, we have the BG1 uh, C for variance based on this. And this is a very practical uh, bucketing method and it gives you a few large buckets. And on the other side, we have the asymptotically best known sieve, which is known as BGL. Um, and this one uses many small buckets to achieve this uh, performance. So we implemented uh, this BGL sieve and um, 
on the CPU side, we see that actually the, the crossover point between the, the BG1 sieve and the BGL sieve already lies at around dimension 90. However, on the GPU side, we don't see any, like the, the crossover hasn't been achieved even in the sieving dimension of 140. And that's because of these small buckets that are memory, uh, that give you memory bottlenecks. So we aren't able to pick the optimal uh, parameters. So some more uh, things we did. So all of this is built upon the general sieve kernel framework. So we get some more uh, things like dimension for free, progressive sieving and, and on the fly lifting. Um, and we moved almost all of the expensive uh, operations to the GPU. So uh, converting some representations of these factors and uh, by lifting and recomputing information about these factors. Uh, we also introduced a cheap filter technique on, on dual factors to avoid uh, many lifts. And by cleverly uh, timing the, the moments when we do these uh, representation conversions, uh, we don't have to save a lot of this information. And this led to uh, about 60% memory savings per factor. Okay, so all in all, this gave us uh, quite a lot of new uh, SAP records. So in green, we see the, the old records by the general sieve kernel uh, using only CPUs. And in red, we see our new records using uh, on a single machine using four uh, GPUs. Um, and our new record in dimension 180 was set in 51 days. But for a direct comparison, the, the record in dimension 176 was achieved in uh, less time than the one in dimension 155 with CPUs, while only using about a factor two more energy. So these tensor cores are really energy uh, efficient also. Uh, so the key takeaways, let the sieving algorithms can efficiently be implemented on GPUs. Uh, however, you have to take care of some memory bottlenecks. And this means that the crossover for BGL and BG1 lies much higher for GPUs than for CPUs. So the code is available at this address and uh, thank you for listening. So are there some questions for Wessel, either in the room or in uh, Zoom? So I don't see any questions. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. So yeah, now we can switch to the Third talk. Uh, ah, hi. Were you? Can you hear us? Were you? Were you? Can you hear us? Were you? Can you hear us? Okay. He, I believe their internet connection is not good enough, so you should proceed with the other talk. Yeah, for where you, if you hear us, we will be the last talk of the session, and now we switch to the to the talk of Nicolas Bord and Pierre Cartman about fast verification of masking schemes in characteristic two, and uh, Nicolas is here in the room and will give the talk. Hi everyone. So yeah, I'm Nicolas Bord, and this talk is a joint work with uh, Pierre Carman and is about uh, fast verification of masking schemes in characteristic two. So first, a uh, bit of context. So we want to make crypto implementations on observable devices, and more specifically, we want to do secure finite field multiplication uh, on um, where the multiplication is computed on a device that is leaking information. 
So this kind of operation is often used in uh, nonlinear components in symmetric crypto, for example, in S boxes, uh, where the inputs and outputs are usually secret. So the problem is to um, protect those uh, implementation uh, when an attacker can um, uh, read information uh, via side channels. So the basic ID that we will use is called masking. So the, the base principle is that we want to share uh, the um, uh, operands and results A, B, and C into shares using a secret sharing scheme. Um, the most used one is the additive uh, secret sharing scheme where uh, the value X uh, is uh, split into D plus one shares um, uh, so that the first D uh, shares are taken uniformly at random and the last one is taken such that the sum of all the shares is equal to the original value. Uh, now that we have shared the operands and results, we want to compute uh, the multiplication uh, securely uh, um, on the shared operand and obtain a shared result. The, um, the, the secure way uh, depends on the, um, on the security model that we will use. But uh, yeah, so here is uh, an example of uh, such a, a circuit. So we have as input a sharing of A and B. Um, uh, in this example, the first step is to compute all the A, I, B, J, and then recombine them uh, to obtain the C, I, so C0, C1, the, the sharing of the results. Um, here we can see that um, uh, there are R0, which is an additional random value that is also taken uniformly at random and it is used to secure the, the, the circuits. Here is another example, which is uh, much bigger. Uh, so here it's uh, at order D equal, equal, equal three. So um, at this order, uh, the, the principle is the same. So first we want to make, to, to compute all the AIBJ and recombine them. Uh, but in this case, the number of additional um, random value that must be generated each time we want to compute the multiplication securely uh, is, uh, to, is four. So uh, there are R0 up to R3. The main research goal is to reduce the, the masking costs uh, in, both the, in terms of both uh, operations, so uh, addition and multiplication, but also in the number of additional random values uh, used uh, during the computation while ensuring, uh, well, obviously the, the correctness, so we want the circuit to compute the, the multiplication, uh, but also the deep probing security. So uh, deep probing means that the attacker can um, gain up to D um, intermediate value on the circuit. And also we want to uh, make sure that the, the, the composition of circuits is also secure. Um, and uh, so that we are able to build more complex circuits from uh, smaller ones. Um, so now an overview of our contribution in this paper. So uh, we uh, propose a new condition for the proving security of a small for small fields for um, for certain security models, and uh, also um, this condition is used in an, a new algorithm to check the the, the deep probing security over F two, and uh, the, um, the this algorithm is uh, implemented uh, as a tool publicly available tool. Uh, that is more efficient than state of the art, um, so that it improved the verification performance by uh, around three orders of magnitude. And thanks to this uh, new verification tool, uh, we were able to uh, verify concrete masking schemes up to uh, the order D equal 11, uh, where um, it was only before uh, verified up to uh, order D equal seven. Uh, we were able also to disprove a conjecture that um, on the security of um, a certain masking procedure. Um, and also we were able to propose new masking schemes that, are, uh, that have better performance. Uh, for example, at order D equals seven, um, our new masking schemes are um, uh, taking 17% less uh, additional random masks. So if you want to uh, learn more about this, you can see the, um, the, the full presentation, 20-minute uh, 20, 20 presentation, or the full version of the paper that is on ePrint. And also the implementation of our tool is publicly available on my GitHub. Thanks for listening. OK, thank you, Nicolas. Are there questions? in the room or on the chat.
So there is a question on the chat from Martin Stam. Uh, which flavors of probing security does your tool work for? Uh, so our tool uh, is able to verify uh, non-interference and uh, strong non-interference, uh, deep roaming security, and also uh, it, um, it can um, uh, verify uh, in the robust probing security model, which is a little bit more hardware-oriented security model. Is this... Uh, yeah. Okay, thanks. Ah, another question. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I actually wanted to ask you if you have any idea if your strategy can be extended like to gadgets with uh, non-linear randomness, like where you don't have necessarily additive random values. Um, you mean for non-additive non uh, secret chain scheme? Or, or maybe, for example, if you have some kind of composition and then you multiply uh, the random values, is is there any way like to extend it to this kind of gadgets for the verification? Um, maybe, um, yeah, I think it can be possible uh, by expressing the, 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 all the probes that are available to the attacker. And then our tool in, is in fact working on the expression of all the probes. So I guess, yeah, if you define correctly, um, yeah, I, I don't know really, but uh, I think it's possible. Maybe. Okay, thank you. There is? Oh. Uh. There is another question in the Zoom chat. Ah, the Zoom chat. Okay, oh. Okay, from uh, Alexei Yudovenko, how is verification related to original security proofs of schemes? Is the aim to catch mistakes or to complement the proof somehow? Yes, so our verification tool is uh, um, used on, um, on masking team where there are no actual formal uh, security proof. So, but, but it can be applied to um, also to already existing to masking scheme with security proof. But the main goal was to uh, provide um, um, uh, verification for uh, masking tools, for masking schemes without uh, security uh, proofs. Okay, so if there are no more questions, we can thank Nicola again. And the next talk of this session is uh, about uh, the power of expansion, more efficient constructions in the random probing model by Sonia Belaïd, Mathieu Rivin, and Abdel Taleb. And Abdel will give the talk. So hi everybody, I'm Abdel and today I'll be presenting our work on the power of expansion, which is a joint work with uh, Sonia Belaïd and Mathieu Rivin from Crypto Experts. So our introduction is actually very similar to the previous introduction by Nicolas Bord. So the idea is that we study the security of the masking countermeasure against side channel attacks. And so the idea is uh, that given a sensitive variable X, we would like to split it into N different values that we call shares. And the recombination would, would give the value of the original secret. And so the idea here is that if an attacker would like to retrieve the value of the secret, he has to retrieve all of the shares. And so this will become difficult as the value of n grows. But so when operating on unshare variables, the um, typical operations on the field, like add, cop, cop, like add, multiplication, and copy, are not enough anymore because we're working on n-share variables. 
So we actually need to replace them by uh, functionally equivalent uh, circuits that we call gadgets, which uh, like operates the same uh, operation, but on unshared variables. So here you can see an example, a dummy example of an addition gadget with uh, two shares. And so in our work, we consider the security of this kind of circuits in uh, what we call the random probing model, which is a different model than the probing model that was introduced earlier. So it is uh, basically a, th a model that describes uh, theoretically how leakage can occur on a physical device. And so it considers that each wire or variable can leak its value with a fixed probability P independently of the other wires. And the reason why we choose this model, it, it's because it offers a um, very interesting trade-off between its closeness to the reality of physical leakage and uh, its convenience for establishing security proofs. So in a nutshell, we consider that a circuit is random probing secure if the leaking variables defined with respect to P uh, depend on the secret with probability at most epsilon. So with probability at most epsilon, um, the leaking wires during an execution uh, will fail and will need all of the secret shares to reconstitute them. And so uh, the main goal is that we would like to decrease the value epsilon as much of, as we can, because this is considered as our security parameter. And so this is where we introduced in a previous work, uh, what we call the expansion strategy. And so the idea is to start from some end share secure gadgets uh, for the three operations on the field and to secure any circuit formed of just variables and wires uh, with a leakage probability P defined on it. The idea is to apply what we call the expansion strategy. So we would replace each wire by N wires and each gate by the corresponding secure gadget. And so this will hopefully allow us to replace the leakage probability P in the original circuit by a new probability epsilon in the compiled circuit. And so the interesting thing is that this strategy can actually be applied recursively by replacing each wire by N wires and each gate by the corresponding gadget until we achieve a certain desired security level. In this case, it's for epsilon to the power K for K iterations of the expansion. And so for certain conditions, well-defined conditions on the gadgets, uh, this strategy is uh, valid and uh, correct. But so the problem is that we clearly cannot apply this strategy for as much as we want because there is uh, a clear co uh, complexity overhead. So if we want to achieve, say, uh, security level kappa, uh, we can express the complexity of the final circuit in terms of the uh, size of the original circuit and kappa to the power e. And so what you just need to know is that e is some kind of a function of the gadget's uh, size or complexity over a function of the gadget's uh, uh, random probing security. And so the main goal in our work is to be able to increase the security as much as we can, because this will allow us to reduce the value of the uh, asymptotic, asymptotic exponent E while still having reasonable gadget sizes. So the goal, uh, what we do in our work is we try to construct generic gadgets. So for any number of shares, that achieve the best possible security. And we also uh, define what is this best possible security and how can we achieve it. And so what we show in our work is that to construct addition and copy gadgets, we can construct them based on a single building block, which would lead to easier conceptions and which would, would also allow us to use uh, some very well-known building blocks from the state of the art, like for example, the ISW scheme which is very widely used and well-known by the community. And so for multiplication gadgets, we choose to study some of the also well-known in the state of the art, like ISW. And uh, we eventually uh, construct our new multiplication gadget, which uh, better meets our needs. So on these curves, you can see a comparison of the value, uh, the evolution of this exponent E in, in terms of the number of shares with respect to the number of shares for three different configurations. Uh, the first one is where we purely use ISW for add copy and multiplication. The second one is where we use ISW for adding copy, but we use our new multiplication gadget. And the third one is where we try to improve uh, the complexities of the add and copy gadgets and still use our new multiplication gadget. 
And so you can see that if we, for example, would like to achieve the uh, lowest value for this exponent uh, for a reasonable, reasonably small number of shares, maybe using the purely based ISW configuration is not the best option. Um, while like ISW is very used uh, in the state of the art, but maybe the conditions that are imposed for the expansion strategy are not necessarily completely met by the ISW scheme. And so we see that by improving the complexity of the, of the gadgets, we can converge to a small value of the exponent E faster than the other configurations. And so we, uh, like, we rigorously analyze this kind of comparison and we explain why we obtain such values and such curves for the different configurations. So in terms of contributions, to summarize a bit, we provide an uh, in-depth analysis of the random probing expansion strategy. So in terms of complexity bounds, uh, limitations of the strategy and relations to other security notions like strong non-interference or probing security. And we also provide some uh, new generic constructions uh, for uh, expandable secure gadgets, which achieve a near optimal complexity. And so this is defined in terms of the best possibly achievable security level and the, the gadgets to size or complexity. So in terms of operations. And we conclude our work with a concrete instantiation uh, using uh, three share and five shares constructions. And uh, we provide so the construction of the full gadgets and we provide the complexity values. And so in this table, you can briefly see a comparison between our new uh, constructions for three and five shares, uh, the last two rows. Uh, compared to a previous construction from Crypto20 based on the free share construction and one from Crypto18, which is based on a different strategy with uh, multi-party computation protocols. And so you can see that we are able to uh, almost divide by half the uh, complexity exponent uh, E, uh, which shows that uh, like there's still much room for improvement on the, the constructions for the expansion strategy. And we can still find the better gadgets to achieve the lowest uh, complexity possible. And so another parameter that I, I didn't introduce here is uh, what we call the tolerated leakage rate. So it's basically the, the maximum probability that we can tolerate in the random probing model where the gadgets are still secure. And the interesting thing is that uh, while we improve on the complexity, we can still tell, so we don't lose in terms of the tolerated probability. We are still uh, almost equal and sometimes slightly better than the previous constructions. So if you are interested in our work, I encourage you to go uh, read our paper and watch the full presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Abdel. Are there any questions? Here in the room, I saw no question on chat. So there is one question here. So uh, yes, thank you for the talk. Uh, why do you start with a three or five share? Would you, uh, could we expect to better, um, not complexity result, but for example, uh, tolerate um, probability um, leakage if we started with uh, more shares? So maybe by using more shares, we can uh, indeed maybe achieve um, like higher security levels, but there are two main reasons why we start with a uh, small number of shares. The first one is that for a small number of shares, we can get some uh, reasonable gadgets complexities and we can, uh, we can actually uh, determine the security level of these gadgets use, using some automatic verification tools like uh, wraps, for example. Uh, and we can uh, have uh, like a complete uh, formula of the uh, security level, which is not possible for gadgets for higher number of shares. And so another reason is that, uh, so the tolerated leakage rate that I was talking about is a function in some way of the number of shares. So if we increase the number of shares, we tolerate uh, lower leakage rates. So what we want to do is to be able to tolerate the best possible rate. And that's why we start with a small number of shares. And since this rate is fixed and we expand the gadget so we can uh, like benefit from the best leakage rate and achieving the highest security level possible, which is not possible if we use, for example, a higher number of shares. Okay, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> 
Um, there is a, a question on the chat by Jorgen Pulkus. Uh, do you think it's possible to improve the tolerated leakage probability of the basic gadgets considerably, let's say to one over 16? So uh, that's a very interesting question, actually. It's still an open question. So in this work, we mainly focus on uh, improving on the complexity. Um, uh, improving the tolerated leakage rate is still an open question. We're actually working on it now to see what kind of gadgets that we need to use and how do they behave uh, with respect to their sizes and what leakage rates we can uh, tolerate. So I think it is possible, but it's not very clear. So it's not evident. We need some further investigations. And uh, it's not clear also uh, if uh, so if we can tolerate the best leakage rate possible, do we still obtain uh, the same improvements on, the, com on the, like, the complexity exponent as we can see here? So there is a certain trade-off, but we are not sure anymore uh, to what extent can this trade-off uh, go, and it's still under investigation. Okay, thank you. We can thank Adele again. and switch to the next talk about leakage resilience of the Shamir secret sharing scheme against physical bit leakages by uh, he Hemanta Maji, Hai Engyen, Anat Paskin Chernyavsky, Tom Suad and Mingyuan Wang. And Hai Engyen will give the talk online. Mm -hmm. So thank you for the introductions. Okay. Um, so let me start with the notion of liquid resilient secret sharing. So in a classical setting, a just dealer take a secret S and sample N random secret share S1, S2, Sn. And the security guarantees that any unauthorized set of shares do not reveal in, in, in any information about the secret. So what if um, an adversary leaks partial information from every share? For example, it leaks one bit from every uh, secret SI. So now the question is that, um, is the joint distributions of the leaky list B1, B2, Bn uncorrelated with the secret S? So the leaky resilient secret sharing ensure that the secret S remain hidden given the leakage. So why we are interested in liquid resilient secret sharing? Actually, it is a very useful primitive and it has collision to many other fields. Uh, for example, it is related to the facilitating problem of preparing error coding codes. So in this problem, the objective is to learn minimum information from each secret share so that uh, we, can we can fully reconstruct the secret S from the given information. And uh, liquid resilience uh, secret settings also has been used at building block for secure multiple decomputation protocols that are, in, uh, that are resilient to local liquid attacks. And it also has been used at um, a modular building block for other primitives, for example, the non-level secret set. So since the introductions, there has been two main uh, research directions on uh, liquid resilient secret setting. So the first research directions is to construct new secret setting schemes that are, liquid, uh, that are liquid resilience. So there is a large uh, body of work on these uh, research directions. And there is another uh, directions that studies the liquid resilience of the prominent secret science schemes, for example, um, the additive secret science schemes or the Shamir secret science schemes. And our works belong to this line of research. So before discussing about our main results, let me introduce the context. So we study uh, Shamir secret sharing schemes over a uh, brownfield field F. Okay. So how does a Shamir secret sharing scheme works? Um, basically, it makes a um, random polynomial of degree S mode K minus one, so that um, the evaluation of the polynomial, uh, polynomial S zero equal to S, and all the secret sets are eval evaluations of the polynomials. And the evaluations as the things places x1, x2, xn. And um, to reconstruct the secret with threshold k, we need at least k shares. And any um, 
Less than case set does not reveal any information about the circuit test. And in our model, um, we consider shamir circuit settings with random evaluation places. So what I mean is that uh, the evaluation places X1, X2, Xn are chosen uniformly at random. And for the leakage model, we consider the physical bit leakage. So all the shares are stored in their um, binary representations. Uh, for example, if the size of the field is 31, and if the share is six, then we restore the share six at 00110. And if the share is 19, we store it at 10011. So the liquid functions may learn uh, the physical bits of the sets. For example, uh, the least physical bits of the share 19 is one. So with this in mind, uh, let me uh, briefly uh, summarize our results. So the first result is a, a feasibility result. Um, that's lambda with a security parameter. And we assume that every secret says the element from a prime field F, where the size of the field F is roughly two to the power of lambda. And let N be the number of parties. And K is a reconstruction threshold. And we also assume that M bits are leaked from every secret share. So our first result so that with overwhelming probability, the Shamir secret scheme is local liquid resilience. Uh, as long as the total amount, the total amount of liquids is less than so n to be introduced by the Shamir secret scheme. And here's the total amount of leakage is m times n because we have n parties, and each party leaks m bits from the share, and so n to p of the schemes equate time lambda since uh, every share has lambda bits and we need exactly k share to reconstruct the secret. Um, and here we, uh, I want to note that the probability is taken over the random choices of the um, uh, evaluation places. Okay. And another thing is that I would resort even how for the reconstruction test of k, it is very, very small in like to any uh, value greater than or equal to two. And in all the um, previous results, usually it required k to be very large. And um, um, for one bit, k usually need to be at least half the number of parties. That means k at least n by two. Okay. So because our result work for um, even k equal to two, it enable liquid resilience of uh, secure multi uh, computations using a CMW style protocols. So to complement the results, we propose a new physical bit leakage. So basically we show that um, when the evaluation places are chosen badly, then the Shamir sequencing scheme is not liquid resilient um, if the reconstruction threshold is small. Okay. So our text, uh, we named the tax in parity of parity of text, and it's very simple. Basically it leaks the least significant bits of each share, and then it computes the parity of the XR of all the leaked bits. And it outputs that bit as a prediction of the secret. And then we show that um, this attack has the advantage that is know about it by the discrepancy of uh, well-known eigen hole distributions as uh, the size of the field tends to infinity. And also we show that it is constant if the reconstruction threshold is small or if, it, if K is a constant. So in a follow-up work, uh, Adam et al. proved that actually the advantage is low valued by one by k factorial for any reconstruction test of k. And also in an ongoing work, we show that in fact, it is exponentially small in k. And this is um, best possible up to a constant factor because when uh, n equal to k, it matches the upper bound by BDIR. Okay. And I also, I also want to note that the BDIR proved that one may leakage one bit, but general leakage, not the physical bit leakage to get an advantage of k to the power minus k. So um, basically this uh, concludes my talks. Uh, if you are interested in uh, our works, you can take a look at uh, our full versions. It's available uh, by this link. Uh, thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Are there any questions either in the room or on chat? Okay, I don't see any questions. No questions on chat, okay. So thanks uh, the speaker again. And uh, I think there was a question that came in late. Sorry, on, sorry. There was a question that came in late on Zulip. I'll copy it into the, ah. the chat. On the chat of Zoom? Um, Zulip. Can you copy it in the Zoom chat, please? Yes, I did. Okay, okay so the, the question is the following. Um, the statement that it's secure over the probability of the shares, does that imply a non-constructive proof that there is some fixed assignment of places for which security holds? Oh, I, yes, I, uh, yeah. I think um, our statement is saying that it is over the, the evaluation places, okay? So it means that for a lot of uh, evaluation places, it, the security helps. So, so most of them it helps, but for some of them, it does not help. And our text shows that um, we can choose adversarially. Okay. And hopefully that answers the questions. I think so, but Mart Martin Stam, who asked the question, can say, okay. Martin says thanks. <laughs> so I think it's okay. Uh, okay, so if there are no more questions, we, we will try now to reach Wei Yu. Wei Yu, can you hear us? Wei Yu, are you here? We cannot hear you. Were you? Can you try? Hello? I think his internet connection is not good enough. Were you? Apparently, you are mute. Can you unmute yourself? No. No, he just disappeared, I think. Yeah, it doesn't work. No. Okay, uh, what can we do? Uh, were you weak? We cannot hear you, so I think we have to to, <laughs> to end the session if we cannot uh, hear your talk. Last try. <laughs> no, it's not working. It's not working, so sorry. Uh, sorry, Wei Yu, we have to... Uh, to close uh, the session. So uh, anyway, uh, we thank all the speakers of the session. And uh, now there is a, a coffee break, an even longer coffee break until uh, 11. Uh, and 11. And 11